Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to the webinar of today. Uh, the speaker of today is uh, uh, Robert Moser, and uh, the talk will be about uh, modeling and numerical discretization and larger dissimulation of turbulence. Uh, so, as usual, I, I uh, introduce the speaker and for, for one or two minutes, and then I give him the stage. So, uh, Robert Moser holds uh, WA Tech's uh, monthly uh, junior chair in uh, computational engineering and uh, uh, science, and is professor of mechanical engineering uh, in uh, thermal fluid system uh, at the University of Texas at uh, Austin. Um, he serves as the director of the Oden Institute's uh, uh, Center of uh, uh, Predictive Engineering and Computational Science, PCOS. Uh, and Deputy Director of the Oden uh, Institute. Uh, Moser earned uh, his PhD in Mechanical Engineering from uh, Stanford University. Before coming to the University of Texas uh, at uh, Austin, he was a research uh, scientist at NASA uh, Amos Research Center and then a professor of uh, uh, Theoretical and Applied Mechanics at the University of Illinois. Uh, Moser conducts research on the modeling and numerical simulations of turbulence and other complex fluid flow phenomena. He has been a leader uh, in the use of direct uh, numerical simulation of, uh, for investigating and modeling turbine flows and the application of uh, such direct simulation to the development of larger dissimulation models. Uh, he has also been active in the development of highly accurate, high resolution numerical approximations for the use in uh, uh, simulation of uh, turbulence and other complex flows. Finally, Moser has been uh, working to develop new approaches for the validation of computational models and to assess their reliability. He has pursued application to such diverse uh, system and plasma uh, systems, uh, re-entry vehicles, solid propellant rockets, uh, micro air vehicles, and the human cardiovascular system. His research is funded by the NSF, uh, the US Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and the US Department of Energy and NASA. Uh, most, uh, Moser is a fellow of the American uh, Physical uh, Society and he was awarded uh, the NASA Medal for Exceptional Scientific Achievement. It is with uh, great pleasure that I introduce uh, and I leave the stage to, uh, to Robert D. Moser. So, Bob, I leave you the stage. You can. Uh, great, thank you. So, I should, should be able to share my screen now. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, is that, uh, does that show up to everybody? Yeah. Great. We saw it and we see it. Uh, Great. Well, th thank you, Francesco, very much for the introduction and for the uh, invitation to speak today. Um, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, and I, uh, as the title suggests, I'd like to talk about a number of, um, of issues associated with the large eddy simulation. And, uh, and we'll go into that here in a little bit. But before doing so, I want to acknowledge. Um, my uh, collaborators, uh, Siegfried Herring, who's a, a former student of mine, Gopal Yala, uh, Yala, who's a current student, and Todd Oliver, who is a uh, 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 research scientist in, in, uh, in my group here at, uh, at the Oden Institute. So, <clears throat> so, so we want to look at uh, issues surrounding modeling and numerical discrimination, sort of the intersection of those two issues in the context of a uh, large simulation. simulation. Um, and Okay, why is it not? Now, why is it not advancing? There we go. Okay. <clears throat> uh, to, to, but I want us to, uh, I want to set the um, context here for this in a, in a minute. Um, you know, we, we have a number of, we have, the, well, I have aspirations for LES that we'll, we'll be able to use it, apply it in complex uh, situations like this, such as, uh, you know, a full air vehicle, um, uh, a, a wind farm, uh, you know, and, and all of these things are, uh, all of these uh, applications have the, um, the characteristics that the, that the turbulence um, has, not only does it have a wide range of scales, it has a wide range of large scales. So it has the scale, uh, we have the, the large scales in the wake, for example, are, are usually the scale of the device. We have, uh, when we talk about the boundary layers, we have you know, the large scales associated with the boundary layers that are, are the boundary layer thickness. And then of course we go to the well-known issue of, of the large scales in, uh, in, um, uh, in the viscous sublayer being, being the, you know, viscous, uh, you know, scaling the viscous units. So this is, 
this is a, um, a problem that we've faced in LES for a large time, a long time, and, and we need to uh, we need to be able to accommodate this wide range of what are, what we call the large scales. And um, and in addition to that, you know, even for the largest uh, scales of uh, turbulence, for example, with this, uh, whoops, I don't didn't mean to do that. Uh, for example, with this um, uh, wind farms uh, situation. Um, the volume in, uh, of, in which we need to represent the turbulence is very large compared to even the largest scales of turbulence. So, so just practicality requires that we use, you know, quite coarse resolution. Uh, in other words, we want we want the LES to be uh, to be as coarsely resolved as possible, um, <clears throat> and still give us reliable results. Uh, now, the problem is that the, our usual um, modeling approaches for this uh, struggle dealing with these conditions. And in particular, there's four that I want to talk about today. Uh, and this is an incomplete list of the challenges that, the, that this, uh, that this coarseness uh, of uh, resolution and practical simulations uh, implies. Uh, I wanna, uh, so the four I want to talk about today uh, uh, are um, the coarse resolution essentially means that there are significant uh, subgrid contributions to the rental stress, to the mean stress. Um, this uh, turns out to be a modeling challenge. The, um, <clears throat> in these uh, complex flows, we have coarse resolution and complex grids. And this basically uh, means that our resolution is, is uh, generally very uh, strongly anisotropic. Uh, the Course resolution uh, also has the um, um, has the consequence that the our numerical discretization effects uh, are, are end up being of first order that we need to deal with them. Um, and uh, finally, because because we generally have large variations in scale uh, of the larger scales, our resolution is is going to be strongly inhomogeneous, and we're going to need to deal with with that and the, and the you know, resulting you know, so-called commutation error that, that uh, has usually been ignored. So each of these violates the, uh, um, uh, violates the assumptions underlying most of our LES modeling. And so we wanna explore how we can address them um, uh, in, our talk, in the talk today. So, so I'm just gonna go through one, you know, in order, one at a time. Um, the, uh, so the issue of, of the, of the um, of having to uh, uh, model the unresolved part of the rental stress. Uh, that's something that, that has been appreciated for a long time. This is a, um, a consequence of the fact that, that we have the problem or the challenge is a consequence of the fact that we then need the subgrid stress to play two roles, to uh, the role that we commonly ascribe to it of representing the uh, energy transfer to small scales uh, that our models are generally formulated for that. But then in addition, there's, uh, there's the subgrid rental stress, which is just the, the mean of the, um, of the subgrid stress. And, and that uh, is something that's been more problematic. In a, in a, a little study um, about uh, two decades ago, Javier uh, took, uh, analyzed uh, filtered channel flow data and uh, and essentially observed that the that the when you um, excuse me when you tune uh, the Smagrinsky model to work well uh, uh, in in the channel flow, you actually under underestimate the subgrid uh, contribution to the to the Reynolds stress by about a factor of five, and that's what's uh, what's shown in this figure. And so and these two things essentially scale uh, differently, and that's that's the problem. So um, what uh, uh, high quality LES has generally uh, uh, been uh, performed by using a fine enough resolution so that this, uh, um, <clears throat> so this contribution of the subgrid to the rental stress is small. And, and here in this figure we see as a function of how much, uh, uh, how much energy is in the subgrid uh, compared to the total, um, the, you know, as, as that increases, uh, you get um, larger and larger errors uh, that occur in the uh, essentially in the uh, um, uh, mean velocity in in a uh, in, an, uh, in a in a channel flow, and so we're we're, we're dealing with a uh, with an issue that that we that 
in this uh, paradigm, you need to, to have quite fine resolution. And that's contrary to what my objectives are. So how do we deal with this? So this is an idea that's been around for a little while, but it's uh, but um, uh, I think we're trying to um, push it forward, uh, which is uh, to, to essentially split the model. Um, model the two um, two roles of the subgrid uh, separately. So we have a, a contribution to the subgrid stress that uh, the subgrid uh, stress that is um, uh, supposed to represent the uh, have the correct mean for the rental stress and a piece that is responsible for energy um, uh, for energy transfer. Okay? So in this and then so in this context, then uh, you know the, the rental stress is just then the mean of this of this tau s and the, and the dissipation of the subgrade energy transfer uh, would then be the contraction of, of this energy uh, based or energy transfer based tau uh, with, the, with the resolved strain rate. So, um, so that's what we'd like to accomplish uh, so that then we can model these things uh, separately. So how, do, so how do we construct these that satisfy these, these distinct roles? Well, this is this is essentially what we're asking. Um, so we have, uh, if, if we have this uh, formulated this way, uh, and we're going to use eddy viscosity type models as a uh, uh, as a uh, example here. Uh, so we'd like to have uh, a the um, the Reynolds stress version, the stress ver uh, part of the eddy viscosity is going to act on the mean stress, mean st uh, strain rate, and then the uh, the energy transfer part is going to act on the fluctuating strain rate, right? and then if you have um, uh, the, con uh, the expected contributions then to this to the stress and to the uh, energy uh, version, uh, so the so the the mean of the stress we'd like uh, this one to not contribute to to uh, uh, the the energy transfer not to contribute to the stress that just makes things easier. So we need these to be to be zero. Uh, well, this one's easy, but uh, but this correlation uh, is not. Uh, and then, uh, likewise, we'd like this correlation uh, to to be zero. Well, we can accomplish that if both nu s and nu e uh, are non-fluctuating quantities. So, we, if we can formulate these models in a way that uh, nu uh, that these adiascasis don't fluctuate, uh, then uh, then this would all work. Uh, the same works out for the energy transfer if we if our viscosities are non-fluctuating. So how do we make all that happen? Well, uh, so for modeling tau s, uh, we're going to model tau s essentially based on uh, a RANS type uh, representation. So um, in fact, we'll, we'll uh, this eddy viscosity, we'll, you'll recognize this as a k epsilon, <coughs> excuse me, a k epsilon type uh, representation for the, uh, 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 for the uh, eddy viscosity. And uh, and you'll notice that I have the expected values of k and epsilon here because uh, that's an, that's important. Um, and then uh, there's this uh, factor here, uh, which is a function of essentially how how well resolved the LES is. This this quantity beta, which is something that we uh, would you know might uh, aspire to be able to compute in an LES, the expected value of the resolved energy uh, uh, divided by the total energy. Um, so Exactly how we formulate f uh, in this context would depend on, on uh, the filter definition, but f of one, which would, would essentially be the Rams result, uh, would be uh, 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 would have to be equal to, to be equal to one. So, so the um, we then need to formulate the uh, we need to k and epsilon, and and essentially we 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 can go ahead and formulate. The, the equation for uh, for the mean k and mean epsilon in terms of mean quantities, the standard uh, standard Rand's uh, uh, type uh, formulation. Uh, we're only using it uh, to to allow us to represent the part of the Reynolds stress that's not uh, that's not resolved. And in doing that, we would account then for resolved quantities uh, in the in the, in the contribution. Uh, so so for example, the production, which of course uh, is the mean strain rate. Uh, contracted with the uh, with the with the rental stress would have these two terms: a resolved part of the rental stress and the model. So, and that can push through to all the other terms. And so that uh, that is actually quite uh, uh, quite useful, and we can do that. 
Uh, the thing that you might ask about is this f of beta. Is that a, is that a justified uh, approach or a justified thing? And and exact and, and in fact we can, it is. Um, this is taken from uh, uh, from some channel uh, DNS channel flow data uh, that indeed the um, uh, the ratio of the subgrid to the total stress uh, is a function of this of this um, alpha uh, alpha, which is uh, the uh, the subgrid energy divided by the uh, full energy. Uh, and, um, and then this alpha is, a, uh, is essentially a function of beta. So, so this, this all works out. Now, there's an important, important point here. Is LES, uh, in LES, and in particular in, in hybrid RANS LES context, uh, transport-based RANS models are, are sometimes used. Uh, for subgrid models. And this is something that you might think we're, you know, a path that we're taking here. Um, and the problem is that that actually is, uh, that actually comes, uh, is a problem. The, the source terms in that are the nonlinear terms in those equations um, are formulated for the, to, to act on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the mean values of the, of the quantities involved. And um, if you uh, consider, for example, this is an example of the destruction term in the epsilon equation, which is usually modeled in terms of epsilon squared over k, then uh, if, epsilon, if we consider epsilon k to be fluctuating quantities, uh, which is what's commonly done in these other, in, in these other approaches, then uh, if you uh, sort of tailor series uh, uh, around the means of these things, you get what you want, which is the, uh, uh, you know, the square of the, of the mean epsilon uh, over, over the mean k, plus a whole bunch of correlation terms. So, so the fluctuating quantities, uh, when, we use, when we use epsilon over k of fluctuating quantities, we essentially are introducing errors that are associated with all these correlations. And so we don't do that. Um, but what's the consequence if you do? This is, a, this is from a hybrid um, uh, rans uh, uh, simulation that, that makes use of these kinds of fluctuating, um, uh, uh, fluctuating uh, RANS uh, equations in, as a model. And, and I'm gonna be referring to a, a few uh, hybrid uh, uh, type simulations like this, because you'll notice that, that this is, you know, we're, we're getting, you know, while I'm talking about this in terms of LES, there has, is a lot of uh, overlap with, with hybrid. So we can learn something about, about this from the way hybrid RANS LES works. So, uh, so in this particular uh, uh, form where we're using uh, a K epsilon model as, uh, as the LES model, uh, you'll see that there's this, uh, compared to what RANS does in the channel flow, uh, we get a, a, a very um, uh, outer flow bump in the, in the kinetic energy. Uh, and that actually has a consequence to the Reynolds stress and, uh, and you end up getting a very a, a distorted mean velocity profile. So that that's basically comes from this issue of applying RANs uh, as, a, as an LES, a fluctuating LES model. So, uh, and this is essentially a, 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 a representation of the error in doing that uh, for several terms in the, uh, several of the, of the source terms that appear in the, in the RANs equations for the production of the kinetic energy, production of dissipation, and the destruction of dissipation. And this is, uh, and you basically see as a function of how much you, uh, um, how much is resolved or how much is, um, uh, yeah, but basically as a function of how much is resolved, uh, you get in incur higher and higher errors. And these errors are relative errors. So we're talking about 50, uh, 50 up to 50% errors. So, so don't do that. But we do do, but we can use RANs. Uh, in the in the uh, in the mode in which I, I'm proposing it here, uh, here's essentially the same uh, kind of problem. Uh, we're using uh, the Chen's uh, um, k epsilon model for for nu s, uh, but it's applied to the mean quantities, so we're applied to average quantities only. Um, and in the context of, of an LES that we're talking about, and um, uh, this fully developed channel at RE tau 5200, and um, and you'll see here, uh, as depending on the on the on the LES resolution, which tells you how much uh, this is uh, essentially alpha. It tells you how much of the of the energy is being resolved. Um, um, that uh, and as as 
as we resolve more and more uh, for, with finer resolution, everything just hangs together beautifully. Uh, we we uh, obtain more higher and higher uh, resolution. We do um, uh, improve our outer flow uh, representation, but it's in a way outer flow uh, energy. But that doesn't essentially spoil the, uh, uh, the the mean because of the fact that we're using the man's models in the correct way. So that's uh, so that's good. So so. We both avoid the issues of using RAMs in LES uh, on fluctuations and have a model that allows us to represent the mean, uh, the, uh, uh, the mean stress. And so we, so we get uh, essentially good results, even ex with extremely coarse uh, LES. I will notice, by the way, that this whole formulation in this context, you'll notice that essentially uh, alpha, which tells you uh, if alpha is equal to one, we uh, uh, were essentially rand. This whole thing has ended up subsuming wall modeling because I, I don't have LES uh, active in the wall, and uh, and essentially hybrid rand's LES. So so we getting we're getting to that uh, from the perspective of thinking about well what should we really be doing with LES through this model split? Okay, so let's go on to the next uh, issue, which has to do with anisotropy of uh, uh, of grids. Um, you know, our models of uh, LES, we, we, we think about homogeneous isotropic turbulence, we think about uniform resolution, uh, things like Smagorinsky and, and, and all its variants and many other models are, are formulated based on that, on, that uh, on those kinds of ideas. Uh, this is the kind of grid we might be thinking about. This is the kind of problem we might want to we might want to apply it to. And this is the kind of grid that you would have we, we might use in this context around one of these turbulent plays. So we formulate our models here, and then we hope that we can apply them here. And um, I guess we shouldn't be surprised that there's some problems that arise. Well, so so what are some of those problems? Well, this is a uh, this is some an example of doing that. This uh, this is a, a, a roll up of a of a, of a turbulent mixing layer um, uh, computed with LES, except that the resolution in the in the in the plane outside, you know, in the plane orthogonal to the to the view here, uh, is either much coarser in this case than the um, uh, than what's shown, or much finer uh, as in, as in this case. Okay. So, and it all depends on how how you how you set the, the length scale on which you're going to by which you're going to use the um, uh, uh, that you're going to use in formulating your LES model. Um, if you if you use a, a common diagonal form in this context. You're gonna you're gonna grossly under uh, you're gonna grossly uh, underestimate your resolution capacity, and you'll you'll basically highly uh, you'll end up with over resolving, um, uh, uh, and and that's wasteful. Even worse is uh, in this case uh, where things are much finer in the in the direction uh, uh, orthogonal to the plane here, um, and an another common length scale that's used is the cube root of the volume. Uh, and, and if you and when we use that, we end up uh, grossly under resolving. So, so uh, and, and basically, of course, this is just wrong. And so, uh, so we need to account for, in some sense, this anisotropy, the resolution, as we as we formulate an LES model. Well, there, you know, there are there have been a few attempts to do that uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the past. One of them is the AMD model uh, that's developed at, at CTR. But we're actually looking for a model where the where the formulation uses a viscosity. In this case, it's going to be essentially a, uh, a tensor viscosity that is not not fluctuating, uh, because that uh, is what will fit into this this paradigm uh, where we are uh, doing this model spin. And so uh, for that, we for, uh, that's AMD models is definitely not in that class. So the idea here is that we use uh, uh, that we we use a, a resolution uh, uh, tensor. This is um, uh, this tensor M. Uh, this tensor essentially has the property that its eigen it's, it's symmetric. Its eigen um, vectors are uh, uh, well. Its eigen vectors on on a, on a you know, sort of rectangular grid will will uh, uh, be in the you know normal to the faces, and its uh, eigen vectors would. Or as eigenvalues would be uh, would be the, the standard grid sizes, but it's essentially a representation of the anisotropic resolution. Um, it, um, 
So uh, we can formulate a model based on that. Uh, we call uh, it it's essentially a anisotropic version of the Kolmogorov model that's formulated in terms of the dissipation. And, um, and, uh, and, and this is it here. Uh, and and it um, also notice that it's based on, on the expected value of epsilon of the of the uh, of the dissipation rate, and that uh, we uh, will have in the in the modeling paradigm we're talking about will have from uh, from Rand's model uh, from a Rand's model, um, and so we don't need to to sort of uh, get length scales and uh, time scales from the fluctuating velocity rate. So, uh, so that's our uh, that's this uh, model, um, and it's um, and this is a, a quite uh, a quite useful uh, model. Uh, we to see how see how it works. We 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 did a um, excuse me. We did a uh, isotropic turbulence uh, simulation on an anisotropic grid. Uh, the the grid uh, is four times finer in uh, one direction than the other. And here are the one-dimensional spectra that come out of that. We're using the standard Spanker, a standard Spankarinsky model, um, and uh, the the spectra in the in the fine uh, direction. Uh, you can see that, of course, they go out much higher wave numbers um, uh, compared to uh, in in, um, uh, in 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 uh, are dotted. You know, this is the the, the, the simulation, and uh, the the uh, solids are are essentially a uh, filter of the uh, uh, filtering of the um, uh, of, of the of the Kolmogorov spectrum. So so the solids are what we're looking for. The dashes are what we get. And in particular, we see in the coarse resolution that we uh, coarse uh, si uh, directions we get a you know sort of a, 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 a energy pile up near the cutoff, uh, and that that actually causes uh, causes a lot of these problems. So we introduced this uh, what we call M43 model. And uh, that this whole uh, this whole mess is essentially cleaned up. So that's how we so we've uh, given ourselves the ability to deal with this anisotropic resolution. Okay, so can we uh, does this all does this sort of uh, combination of of uh, model splitting where we use a anisotropic uh, um, um, N four three model as well as a, as a, a Rams uh, model in this case we're using B two F model does it does it actually work in something more complex than channel? And here's a test case uh, for this uh, so-called periodic hill. Uh, the experiments were done by, by RAP back in 2009. There's some reference to LES that have been done uh, uh, back in 2009 as well. Um, and and this is the, these LES are, are essentially wall-resolved wall LES. And um, they require 13 uh, uh, million uh, uh, spatial degrees of freedom. Uh, and then uh, we're we're using this um, model split for uh, LES uh, using a V2F Rands model for tau s, this M43 model for tau e, and uh, with about a, a factor of 25 uh, of fewer degrees of freedom. And this is just an image to show you what that what that res uh, what that simulation looks like. Uh, the question is, does it does it uh, does it work? Uh, do we get the right statistics back? Uh, we can see here the the, the mean uh, streamwise and wall normal velocities and um, green. Uh, we, we're labeling it TAMS here. Uh, the green is this uh, model split formulation, and the um, uh, red is the standard RANS. And uh, we've got uh, uh, the uh, experiment and this uh, this reference LES in here too. And we see here that this essentially very coarse uh, LES has has essentially done the job. There are a few little um, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, anomalies in the uh, uh, in the vertical velocity, and that uh, uh, that actually is a, a a consequence of a of a of a detail. There's a detail issue that that uh, needs to be refined here. You can imagine that there are some details that I'm not covering here about how you might actually uh, do this in practice. Um, and so some of those details are there. The, the concept seems to work quite well. Okay, so that's 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 my first two um, sort of challenges I wanted to talk about. So let me move on to a third. And for this, uh, let, let me uh, it'll be helpful to set some some nomenclature because we're going to start uh, thinking about the numerical um, uh, discretization and how numerical discretization interacts with uh, with modeling. So here's our 
our um, excuse me. Here, here's sort of our stand the standard way we have of writing the filtered uh, Stokes equations we might use for LES. And of course, we have uh, the problem that we um, uh, that in general the, our filter might not commute with differentiation. And then, uh, furthermore, uh, um, we have the problem that we have to numerically discretize whatever uh, derivative operators are being involved here. So, so essentially, we end up writing this equation this way, uh, where delta is whatever numerical um, uh, derivative operators we might apply, uh, and f is 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 some uh, operator that is that is bringing this product back into the into the function space in which the filtered quantities are the thing uh, and there are you know there are various ways to do that and and um, I'm, I'm at the moment I'm agnostic about about uh, at least in the current context agnostic about about how we do that uh, and then you know if we want to patch this up to get back to here uh, we introduce some some error terms right so one of them uh, as our standard, uh, tau ij term, this is our, our error, uh, our, our subgrid stress error. But then we have some terms that are, are patching up the fact that I'm not using the derivatives, uh, correct, uh, uh, the actual derivatives, and that I somehow have, have, um, have swapped the order of filtering and differentiation. So we broadly call these commutation terms. Uh, there's, an inhomogene there's an inhomogeneous version, which is a sort of, a sort of the, the, uh, the, the standard sort of inhomogeneous part, but there's also a homogeneous part, which actually um, um, characterizes some of the issues surrounding the, the use of numerical discursion. So, so I just use that to set the, set the stage here. Well, that, those terms will show up a little bit. Now, when we, these numerical derivatives, um, of course, they have uh, numerical errors. Oops, I, I have a tech error here. Sorry about that. Didn't notice that. Um, the the, uh, the discrete uh, these discrete derivative operators can be characterized by an effective wave number, which uh, we'll, I'll call tilde uh, uh, tilde ka uh, kappa. That's what I should have had here, uh, and, it's, and essentially defined by applying uh, in a uniform uh, grid context um, the um, derivative operator to the complex exponential. Uh, the complex exponential is essentially the, a eigenvector of this, and so i times k kappa tilde is the eigenvalue of the of the, of the derivative operator, and, and we call that an effective wave number. And it, it, you know, this is well known. We uh, we uh, we've all dealt with this. For for, for example, uh, if I if we um, uh, what that looks like, this is for some uh, um, some finite difference operators. Uh, just, a, just as an example. And the, the effective wave number uh, looks like this. It's accurate at low wave numbers uh, as a function of kappa, but it becomes uh, highly inaccurate at high wave numbers. Now, if we, we, if we apply this in the context of, uh, this is just to, to sort of set our nomenclature and, and to set our thinking about this. So we apply this in the, in the context of a simple convection equation. Uh, if k tilde is not, e kappa tilde is not equal to kappa, then the phase velocity of, of the, of the uh, wave will depend on kappa. And of course, this is what's known as dispersion. Uh, that's why we're calling it dispersion error. And, and we see that that, of course, is going to happen in spades uh, here when we get into higher wave numbers. And in particular, if the derivative of the effective wave number with respect to kappa is less than zero, um, but, uh, the group velocity of these, of these um, of these uh, uh, waves will end up being negative, and that actually has important consequences. Uh, so, so here, are, here's a plot of the group velocity, and that's basically it basically comes from the derivative of, of, the, of these guys, and um, and you see that it gets negative, and actually for the higher order terms, it gets it gets quite negative. So the group velocity can be negative and much larger uh, for in these higher terms, negative and much larger than the than the actual phase velocity. Uh, uh, the uh, exact phase velocity a. Okay, so so what are the consequences of that? Again, just to you know, these are things that uh, we probably many of, uh, of you are familiar with. But to but to set the ideas, uh, you know, that just let me remind you: if I take a pulse and I convect it by the convect by the uh, by the convection equation uh, with a um, with a numerical uh, scheme that has dispersion error, 
uh, that pulse will will uh, deconstruct and and uh, be spread out by that dispersion error, uh, and that's what's shown here uh, at different times uh, going forward. Okay. Um, more uh, more interesting, if I have a pulse, uh, a, a modulated pulse like this, this is the initial condition uh, in black, um, and um, I let it go with uh, with uh, uh, several uh, um, different resolutions. Uh, in this, uh, if, uh, for the finer resolution here, I let it go, and it will uh, propagate to the right, but at the wrong speed, and it also spreads out, so it makes a mess. This, by the way, is where is where, what the exact solution would be. But if I use an even coarser resolution, so that I'm in the regime where I'm, I have negative group velocities, we see that all everything is propagating uh, back in the back in the in the negative direction. So this is a uh, uh, you know, this is a mess, and if, if this is happening in our LAS, we can imagine this would be a problem. Well, what happens um, um, if I'm if I if I'm doing this in a in a in the actual turbulence? So let, let me first uh, uh, look take an example here. We're we're this is our our formulation we're talking about. We're, we're posing an LAS. We're essentially um, ignoring uh, this homogeneous. Um, uh, um, this, ho this homogeneous commutation, which represents these, these dispersion effects and everything else. <clears throat> and I want to uh, ask the question, uh, uh, well, what happens to the spectra, spectrum of an, is of an isotropic turbulence when you do that? Okay. And, and what I'm, what I'm going to point out is that, well, look, the, um, uh, if, I, if I look at what the, what the transfer spectrum is in the, uh, in the LAS context, um, we can we can work that out, and and the point is is that where the tildes occur um, is 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 in this uh, uh, in this derivative uh, part. Here. This is actually for the skew symmetric form of the nonlinear terms. So um, so that actually is an interesting consequence. Uh, it ha has a number of interesting consequences, and let's see what uh, what what happens in an actual LES when we do that. Uh, oh, I, I should notice. I should note that we're using as an eddy viscosity model the um, uh, the this is the Kolmogorov uh, uh, model of the, of the which is uh, because we're using isotropic turbulence is, is appropriate. Isotropic resolution is appropriate. Okay, so one more thing. Uh, I'm going to do this in the context. Uh, I should have mentioned this earlier of the of the of the turbulence being convected by a, a uniform velocity through the grid. Okay, so there's a uniform velocity here. So we have the, the uniform velocity term here, and this is the standard nonlinear term. Now, of course, uh, for the real turbulence, uh, Galilean invariance tells us that there should be no effect of that. Um, but of course, numerics uh, might tell us differently. So with this whole paradigm, if u is equal to zero, um, this is the spectrum I get. Everything is quite nice. And um, I, uh, compared to the, to the theoretical spectrum in black, here. And, um, and in fact, if I look at the transfer spectrum, uh, everything uh, behaves quite as, as I might expect, right? So I have transfer of energy from the large scales into the small scales, and that transfer goes right down to the, to the, um, uh, to the cutoff wave number. So actually a quite nice model. Everything is beautiful. And, and we know that this is easy to do in, in isotropic turbulence. However, if I set U and these units equal to 35, um, I get this. I get a, a, a much uh, more, um, I get a, a much worse result. And this is for various different, uh, uh, various different numerical discretizations, most of them based on these ones. Uh, so um, this, is, uh, this is quite disturbing, right? And, and the reason that you get this is seen in the, in the transfer spectrum. Uh, and that is that, you know, as you get to higher wave numbers here, the transfer into the high wave numbers actually gets shut down. And so the question is, why does that happen? And um, we, can, we can analyze that and figure out how that happens. It turns out uh, we, we can uh, do a multi-scale, uh, a multi-timescale analysis. Uh, uh, there's a timescale of the, of, the, of the convection. We're assuming that U RMS is uh, over U, is, is, uh, which I'll call epsilon here, our, our order parameter will be much less than one. We do a multi-scale analysis in time. I have a fast time scale, which is the convection time scale and a slow time scale. And um, which is basically similar to using Taylor's hypothesis. 
Uh, and so we end up uh, with a representation of the, of the Fourier transform of the velocity, which is sort of a, a, a slow, uh, uh, slowly varying part times a fast varying part, which is this um, uh, just straight convection based on, notice, K kappa tilde. Kappa tilde is what is uh, governing that. If you run that through and look at what the transfer spectrum is in that in that context um, uh, with this formulation, uh, you essentially get this. You 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 get this uh, uh, um, exponential term with the with the differences in all the kappas there. Uh, and then if you take the time average, which is what we what, what we care about, um, because of the fast uh, slow de decomposition. Uh, we we end up having a fast a slow average of the of the, of the uh, Fourier coefficients, which is what we are used to, and then a, a, a fast time average of this guy, and and clearly that guy is going to be zero unless this uh, omega t is zero, essentially unless the cap is balanced, and the cap is would balance if kappa tilde was equal to kappa, and everything would be fine, and that's why we don't see this. When we convect a, uh, a turbulence through, um, um, uh, say, with a spectral method, but with this dispersion error, um, we end up shutting down uh, the transfer to the high wave number. So that's basically the reason for the observation we just saw. Okay, so let's look at dispersion error in another context. Uh, what happens when a wave, uh, uh, and that is uh, in a context of non-uniform uh, and non-uniform grid and uh, non-uniform resolution. So what happens when a wave packet propagates uh, from a fine region to a coarse region, fine region where, it's, where, it's, uh, can, uh, where it can be resolved, uh, for coarse region where it can't. And so the idea here is that the pulse, uh, what happens, and this is, this is well known from numerical analysis, is that the pulse, uh, um, you can analyze this uh, in, from the perspective of wave propagation. And uh, what happens is the pulse is reflected back uh, into the fine region with a wave number that uh, is um, with wave numbers that are transformed to the to the wave numbers with the same ca kappa tilde but with negative group velocity, so so the point is that if I'm here uh, uh, in, in say I'm I'm, I'm at this uh, value of kappa delta x, I might have these. Um, uh, well, let's go down. Let's get smaller. Uh, yeah, let's go okay, go higher. I have this value of kappa delta x, so um, I I might look at and, well, what happens when I um, when I uh, do this reflection? Um, the kappa, kappa tilde is preserved. It's actually the frequency of the of the wave is preserved. But then I, I end up getting uh, reflected waves that have um, the, the kappa associated with uh, this uh, branch of the of the effective wave. Okay. So that's well known. Uh, and just to see, see visually what the what the result of that is. Um, if I if I take this uh, this pulse, uh, which is nicely resolved in the fine region, I propagate it into a coarse region. The coarsening is by a factor of of, um, of uh, four here. Um, the um, I, I propagate it into the coarse region, and you've got a a um, uh, a you know partial uh, propagation into the coarse region. I get large dispersion errors of the type we talked about. But I also get a reflection of some of, the, of some of that into these very high wave number, into this very high wave number noise. In this case, if I have a higher wave number wave packet, uh, a higher frequency wave packet, then uh, this is completely reflected and it, and it, and it, um, it just propagates back uh, into, the, uh, into the fine region. So what happens if I do a, a turbulence simulation that way? If I take a, uh, a, a, a um, plug of turbulence, I'm propagating it rapidly uh, through this uh, through this grid of this type. Uh, again, I have a coarsening by a factor of four. And, and so what happens is that in, um, well, as, as this guy propagates into the coarse region, it gets, it gets all smeared out. But it also begins uh, propagating backwards, uh, stuff backwards into the fine region. And in fact, what's happening here is, uh, is this, it's, it's bumping into this coarse region over here. And so it's actually reflecting back. So it reflects this way and reflects back again. Uh, but it's actually, I've created all of this, this mess. Uh, and we see, and we can see that in the spectra uh, that, that are going here. That, uh, and that we have this, uh, as opposed to the spectrum that I might expect to have, 
uh, there's this all this high wave number of uh, content, content, which is all this crud that gets generated by the, by the reflection. Uh, this then uh, propagates into the coarse region. This is what's, uh, what can propagate into the coarse region. So that's sort of the part that we were hoping to preserve. But then we got we we are left with all this noise in, in the fine region, which is basically just bouncing back and forth between uh, the, these uh, the, the boundaries between the two. And then finally, this is a periodic uh, uh, thing, and it, it you know, this guy will propagate all the way back, and I'm left with with all this noisy business. Okay, so um, and that is reflected then in these um, in these spectra. Uh, uh, at, at later at later times, so I got all this noise, and I have also a, some part of the spectrum that is that is as I expected it to be. So, uh, and by the way, this is what uh, this is what happens in the coarse region is that you know instead of the full spectrum that I, uh, that I might have in the fine, I end up you know truncating to the coarse, and that's of course what I wanted to have. So the problem is that I pollute the fine region. Okay. Um, and so this is a this is a problem. So what are the implications of all this for modeling? I just have just a couple of things I wanted to say is that the um, so we have to account for the characteristics of numerics in this modeling, and um, in particular, convection of turbulence by a mean introduces particularly damaging dispersion errors. And of course, we never want that to happen, right? We never have mean velocities. So no, this is really a problem. Um, Ideally, the LES we might uh, our LES resolved scales would exclude these modes that are uh, that are strongly dispersive, and, and and certainly those with negative root velocities that would cause all this problem. But then there's the issue about how you actually do that. And in practice, our models are going to need to be needed. Our models are going to be needed that uh, ensure that this remains true. I have a modest suggestion for that here, and it has to do with a with an operator that, that we can construct from sort of the numerical derivative operators and use it essentially as a, as a, as, as a, a damping or, or a filtering operator. And that is the, the second derivative operator minus, minus the first derivative operator applied twice. Uh, and, and the second derivative operators, this is again from, from uh, these lines, uh, they, um, uh, in these formulations, they might uh, have um, uh, eigenvalues that look like this, whereas applying the first derivative twice, twice looks like this. So in uh, like these curves, and so when you uh, take the difference of them, by the way, the exact second derivative is the is the, uh, um, is the black line. When you take the difference of them, you have something that is uh, highly active in the region where the dispersion is a, uh, is a mess, and in particular where the group velocity is negative. And so that's what this this operator gives. And so if you if we use this operator as a basis of of, of formulating some uh, some models to damp things that are in this region, um, maybe that would be useful. It actually has a nice property that uh, the leading order, it looks like a hyperviscosity. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the seventh order B-spline one, it, it has, has this structure. Um, and so that's, that's nice and it actually, uh, we can use that but doesn't introduce all the weirdnesses that we have to deal with uh, for, um, excuse me, for uh, boundary conditions and, and so forth. With, with something that behaves like this. So um, we tried this out in uh, uh, a formulate a model like this. Um, basically, this is a, 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 a ice drop turbulence that's being, uh, there's um, no convection in this case, but it's ice drop turbulence that's just evolving in a grid that's non-uniform. <clears throat> and we formulate this model based on this B2 minus B11 uh, to account for some of the badness that occurs at the high wave numbers. And uh, there's two parts of it. One is uh, essentially accounting for the uh, for energy that is trying to be transferred into these uh, into these uh, modes, and the other uh, is essentially accounting for the what happens at the interface where they uh, where they uh, where you know stuff is being moved back and forth from pine to quartz, and and we and, and so it, it is um, uh, proportional to the derivative of the of the, of the resolution. And so I apply that in uh, and actually apply this model uh, as opposed to just a standard uh, uh, model that's based on the Kolmogorov model. Um, the Kolmogorov model gives me a mess when I'm here in the transition region uh, in terms of the spectrum, but the um, but uh, introducing this term uh, cleans that quite out. So just in summary, then um, our practical applications need to attend to these complications. Uh, model splitting and this uh, with RANs and M43 seems to quite 
useful and it gives us this bonus of naturally addressing wall modeling and, and hybridization of RANs and LES. And then this dispersion error resolution and resolution in homogeneity uh, can really be cause of mess. And, um, and so to sort of be, um, I'm talking about when I have very close resolution, uh, and mo models formulated uh, for the numerical uh, discretization uh, uh, seem to be uh, uh, needed in this, in this context. So for that, let me end and ask if you have any questions. So thanks very much for your attention. So thank you very much, uh, Bob, for, uh, for the presentation. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, as you said, that's uh, opened uh, the stage for discussion. So whoever wants can just uh, unmute your, um, you can just unmute your mic and ask a question directly if you wish, or you can write in the chat and I can report the question. Oh yeah, let me see. Got one, got one shot. So once again, is there any any question? Any participant who wants to ask a question? Sorry about that. I didn't mean to didn't mean to end that. <laughs> Ariana, I think you had your hand up at some point. Did, did you have a question? Bob, this is Jim. I was going to ask a question. Yeah, sure, Jim. How are you? Good. How about yourself? Looking forward to seeing you in a few weeks. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So um, this, this splitting idea, um, am I getting the right picture in thinking that the basic concept, um, okay, so in large eddy simulation, the basic idea that we've been working on um, is that the um, mean um, is contained within the resolve scales. So that by using an LES rather than a RANS approach, we should in principle be able to generalize our predictions and improve our predictions of the mean, as well as perhaps second order moments if it's possible. But the idea is to do a better job with the mean. So am I, am I capturing your idea correctly that the basic idea then is to kind of split the simulation into um, a recognition that the mean should be modeled um, with a RANS type of model and then just the deviations from the mean model with an LES type of a model. Is that, is that the basic idea there? No, no, it's not, it's, it's not that. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's the, um, the, because we're, we actually are using in the mean equation, right? We are actually using the resolved fluctuations. Right, so the so the mean is responding to the resolve fluctuations. So the problem is that if, if your resolution is is uh, too coarse uh, for the resolve fluctuations to carry, you know, um, almost all of the Reynolds stress, mm -hmm. then um, and that's the the regime in which I want to operate. Right, uh, then um, I have a problem because my my model, uh, yeah, you know, sure. the models that we've been working with are formulated to, to get the energy transfer right. They're not formulated sure. to represent sure. the mean, uh, the, the mean of the subgrid Reynolds stress. <laughs> I mean, the mean, the mean subgrid, the mean the subgrid the contribution subgrid to the Reynolds stress, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, 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 we, so, the, so, so RANS is, uh, so RANS is only used as a, as a, as a tool to, uh, to formulate a model for the, um, subgrid contribution to the Reynolds stress. Okay, all right. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, yeah, it, well, sort of. I, I, I mean, I, obviously, I, I've always argued that when um, the Reynolds stress contribution from the resolve scales is not some relatively large percentage of the total Reynolds stress, say 80, I've always drawn numbers like 80% or more, then the concept of LES breaks down because the notion is that the model terms should be of higher order uh, in an LES, whereas in a RANS, the model terms are first order and in an LES, the model right. terms should be higher order. And that that breaks down when the in integral scales are not being properly resolved by the grid. So you're saying, okay, let's still call it an LES. And let's consider the case where the integral scales are not being properly resolved by the grid. And then you're saying, okay, let's use RANS to help with, the, with, with that kind of a situation. Is, is that closer to, to what you're saying? More or less, yeah. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm asking us, okay, you know, our standard approach in LES is that we're going to put our cutoff, you know, you know, deep enough into the inertial range that, you know, 
indeed, we're carrying almost all the Reynolds stress, right? I want to move that up. Uh, I want to move it as uh, to as large as possible, okay? Because that's actually what I, you know, what I need if I want to if I'm going to apply this in in sort of complex applications, right? Sure, sure. And, well, I, you know, again, I, I sort of always argue that LES is when the uh, rental stresses are being resolved at some large percentage, 80% or more. Uh, and then RANS is when the filter cutoff is not resolving the rental stress um, very much. And therefore, you go to a RANS formulation. And then when the grid cutoff is in between, um, neither RANS nor LES works properly and you have a problem. And of course, a lot of people are struggling with that, with that issue. Yep. Um, yeah. So um, I'm, it's not clear when you're saying coarse, where in that, you know, properly resolved to RANS uh, regime. No, so, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm trying to move us into, I'm, travel, I'm trying to remove, move us into the regime where, um, you know, where, we're, where we have a problem, right? Where, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah, yeah, where it's in between, yeah. right, got it. Yeah, yeah, so if you want to, I mean, if, if, you, if you prefer not to call that LES, that's okay with me, I mean. Sure, sure, I mean, it's yeah. part of the <laughs> semantics, but, but we do have to deal with this issue, like you say, like near surfaces, that's always a problem. It's always a problem, that's right, that's yeah, right. right. Okay, um, I get it. Uh, I need yep, to understand yep. better your formulation, but I get, I get the concept, so thank yep. you. Yep, yeah, of course. See ya. Talk to you later. Yeah, see, see you in a few weeks. Uh, in the meantime, there is uh, someone who in the, in the, yeah. asked a question in the chat. So, the near world behavior of the subgrid stress and the instantaneous back scatter of energy are some of the desired properties of the subgrid scale model. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you please share your thoughts in terms of your approach? Sure. Well, so, so I'm actually using models that um, uh, for the energy transfer that are not, uh, that don't, don't support backscatter. And, um, you know, we can argue about whether that's important or not. Um, it's, uh, uh, but we're not, um, we're not doing that. And, and, it, uh, and it arises from the fact that we're using, um, uh, you know, uh, diffusion or you know eddy viscosities that are that are essentially uh, considered to be mean quantities. Um, with regard to the near uh, the uh, the near wall, uh, so it you know, sort of depends on how you how you uh, approach it, right? So um, the simulations I showed you, it turned out that the near wall ended up not being resolved, right? Because I was using a very coarse uh, uh, um, resolution, uh, and it was just. Um, uh, so I essentially was doing a you know, wall model uh, LES. So um, the uh, um, you know if if one's doing a, a much finer uh, resolution, then you know we we uh, end up um, uh, so that you are resolving some of the fluctuations in the near wall region. Uh, then you know we have to ask about about you know what, how well the models uh, work. Um, I don't have any particular reason to think that the models we're using would work particularly well, or that they'd work particularly poorly. Like they would work in the same way that most do. Um, I don't know. Does that does that answer your uh, uh, your question, uh, Vidas? Uh, well, we can uh, we can wait for it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, great. Uh, is there someone else who would like to ask a question? Once a question, just once again, just feel free to unmute your mic and ask the question yourself, or you can just write in the chat and I can report the question. So, in the meantime, I have a question myself. So, ah, okay, there is a chat. Yeah, that's why, yeah. The chat, so, so let's let's give priority to the to this to the participants, and then I can ask mine. So, how sensitive are your results uh, to blending function alpha choice? Is the two losses uh, hybrid method from uh, uh, Manchester? There was an attempt to to base it on the ratio. Ratio of leg scales. Yeah. Width. Yep. Yeah. So so um, so this this particular in the you know when when you look at what we're doing in the context of of, uh, of hybrid uh, models. Um, which you can, of course. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm actually proposing that the, you know, that we should think about the, 
you know, this model splitting is something that makes sense in LES um, uh, or, or whatever Jim wants to call it. Um, um, uh, regardless whether or not you're you're thinking of it as model uh, hybrid model, but any, in any case, so so we have looked at the, at a number of things. So the the this the the reason that um, this energy this resolution scale uh, issue uh, seems to be an appropriate is an appropriate uh, thing in this uh, for this um, I wouldn't call it a blending, but for the for the scaling of the of the unresolved Reynolds stress. Um, is because um, the it is a, a representation or it is a direct measure of what is actually being resolved now, right? As opposed to uh, in the um, uh, in the uh, when we're using the, the the filter scale as a as a as a metric, as a as opposed to saying, well, what could be uh, resolved, right? So. Uh, does that does that make sense? So that's that's why we're using why we're using the dependence on alpha. So, uh, yeah, I think I mean we can uh, uh, we can wait for the for the see if they for respond. The answer, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, in the in the meantime, uh, I would like to ask you a question regarding the uh, application of hybrid models to compressible uh, turbulence. Is there mm -hmm. like, um, could you somehow share some thoughts about the difference of uh, uh, hybridization between the models which are done in uh, compressible and compressible turbulence? Because issues are quite different. Yeah, yeah. So, so in for well, we're actually working on that. I have a student uh, working on that on that uh, as we speak. Uh, but <clears throat> the 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 concepts uh, that you know of model splitting, and actually even the the M four three model and some of the other things that we're doing, they still uh, they 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 transition over. Um, now, the, as you might imagine, there are a lot of, um, of you know, additional details that, that arise in the, in the um, uh, excuse me, there's a lot of additional details that arise in the, in the um, uh, compressible case. And, and so those are, are things that we're having to, to work through. Um, so, but, but uh, overall, the, the concept uh, applies and uh, we're, you know, we're, um, we're actually pursuing um, a, um, a couple of test cases uh, to test this whole uh, concept out in compressible in the compressible context. Okay. Oh, does that does that help, Francesco? Yeah, yeah. That's thank you. Thanks. Um, let's see if there is someone else who would like to to ask a question. So, uh, yeah, Jim, go ahead. So I have one on the uh, dispersion part of your talk, Bob, which I thought yeah. was quite interesting, actually. So, um, all right, so it, it's it's clear from what you were describing that when the grid uh, resolution changes um, rapidly or, or spatially rapidly, with, you know, in, in some domain, like you showed the example where you went from a fine grid to a coarse grid and you get this reflection due to mm -hmm. and so on. So that's really uh, interesting and I think important. Of course, in CFD, we, we've all learned that you, you're not supposed to change grids dramatically like that. You're supposed to change grids gradually. There's a variety of reasons for that, uh, and this seems to be a, another one. So when you consider grids that are sort of more realistic from a CFD, if you say, okay, you have a good quality grid, um, and we worry about the rate at which the grid resolution is changing, especially in turbulence, where you've got you know, the, the range of scales is, is that you're resolving is changing uh, from place to place uh, in the grid. So when you consider more realistic grids where the resolution is changing more gradually, is this still a big deal? Uh, yeah, actually it is. Um, um, the, the theory behind this, and, um, and actually if you're interested, I can point you to, to the references. Um, the theory, which, is, which aren't ours, right? This, the theory behind this uh, basically says that Okay, if you if you change the the grid smoothly enough, and 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 how smooth that has to be, you, you know, there's some there's some scalings for that, and if the um, 
uh, the there's essentially no appreciable dispersion um, in either the fine or the coarse resolution. In other words, if it's well resolved in the coarse side, and you apply this, uh, uh, yeah, and you have this um, representation or have this uh, smooth uh, transition, then it can go through and not reflect. But if if you if uh, if on the other hand you start introducing significant dispersion when you get into the coarse region that you didn't have in the fine region, it'll still reflect. Sure, and, I guess what I'm asking, if you're, if you're careful in how you design your grid and keep this dispersion issue in mind as well as yes. all the can you control yeah. it that way? You can, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. You need to control it that way. Uh, uh, that's, that's exactly right. And that's actually why we were looking at these things like this B2 minus B11, B1, B1 operator to, to be sure to get rid of all the stuff that, that does this, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, but, okay. but, but yeah, I mean, smooth, a smooth transition doesn't save you un, unless you are, 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 you know, are really well resolved. You know, in other words, if you don't have anything. Oh, I see your plane. Yeah, 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 right, okay. So just a, a minor and By the way, of course, a, a, a rapid transition will reflect even if you're well resolved on both sides. So that's another, problem with it right <laughs> say that one again a rapid a rapid transition a, a sharp oh, yeah, 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 will it. reflect in, in any case right in any case right got yeah. it got it right yeah. right so i had i have just a stupid little question so how can you uh, uh so if you if you take the second derivative i'm not sure what you were taking the second derivative of but you have the second derivative minus twice the first derivative if i understood correctly that expression. Right. um but the units of the second derivative and the first derivative squared are not the same. So how can you do that? Sure they are. They're both they're both one over delta x squared. One over one over x squared or length squared. Well, uh, one, the first derivative times like if you're taking the first derivative of velocity, it's velocity uh, with respect to position, it's velocity over distance squared. If you're taking the second derivative, it's velocity, it's no, not no, no. squared over no, distance. No, if I, I apply I apply the first derivative twice. You know, apply the first derivative. Oh, got it. Okay. And then got apply it. the first derivative again. Right? <laughs> well, that's the same thing. Okay, got it. Okay, now I didn't understand. I thought yeah, you yeah. were multiplying. The expression made it look like you were multiplying the first derivative by itself. That's what the expression looked like. No, no, no. That, that's no, no, no. That's got it. B, yeah, B one. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're um, um, okay. All right. Very good. Proposing the operator B one with I said itself. it was a stupid question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. See you. Yeah, 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 I'll talk to you later, Jim. Thanks a lot. Uh, so thank you once again for uh, uh, for uh, the discussion, Jim. And actually, I have a question related to to a point uh, which has been uh, raised by uh, in, in the in the question of before, uh, which is um, related to the error which you showed. Uh, um being correlated to, to the grid uh, that changed quite uh to, to the grade yeah, so to our grid size and mm -hmm. uh I, I think on one side you have the arrow which is related to reflection okay that's that's it but then there is another kind a, a, a characteristics of that error is that it's kind of induced uh, spurious oscillations which uh, kind of spoil your uh, your uh, uh, your spectrum, right? Right, right. And oh, you're, I, you're, you're talking about this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I ask myself is if it's if it could be of help to use a kind of an interpolation scheme like uh, uh, intrinsically non uh, non uh, uh, oscillatory, like a Wino scheme or something like that, which would not prevent the reflection, but at least uh, would avoid to to create this kind of spurious fast oscillations which spoil the the the, the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so in, indeed um, uh, you know dispersive numerics I mean, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, dissipative numerics uh, will uh, will help kill this stuff. Um, you know the the um, this, and, and of course, that's something that, that people uh, have proposed. You know, people do use uh, in LES, and 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 that they uh, um, uh, you know consider them that uh, that dissipation is part of their their model, um, and all of which is you know not there's no nothing uh, intrinsically uh, wrong with that. 
Um, the um, you know the thing I think the thing that's important is that whatever you do, whether it's using the the um, you know sort of dissertative dis merits, whether you're using a uh, you know an operator you you build just for the purpose, like I did. Um, you you want to be sure that you're controlling the only the scales that you want to. In other words, you want to you want to be careful not to not to disrupt the resolved scales. That's yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. That, that's that's the only that's the only that's the only problem. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a bit of a thing. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, is there someone else who would like to ask a question? So, just once again, I I repeat myself. Uh, open your mic if you feel free to open your mic if you want to ask a question, or just write it in the chat and I can report it. Uh, wait a few seconds. Okay, so this does not seem to to be the case. So uh, it's like we're done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's that's. Thank you very much for for the for this presentation. That's uh, it opens uh, quite a number of topics and uh, uh, very interesting discussion. And uh, yeah. Well, it was a pleasure to 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 host you. Oh, well, thank you very much, Francesco, and 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 thank you very much for the invitation. It was a it was a pleasure to talk, and uh, uh, too bad we can't go get a glass of wine now. <laughs> 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 Alrighty, uh, good to see you all. Thank you so Have much.